So far we have discussed how to convert a linear sequence of uh, characters or tokens to, an, to a parse tree and then to an abstract syntax tree. From here on, a program for us is just an abstract syntax tree. So the abstract syntax tree represents the program. And, and now we want to analyze that program further for correctness and, and also code generation and optimization and other things. So from now on in the course, we're just talking, whenever we say a program, we're really talking about the abstract syntax tree. So the, the, so the first step uh, that we do with the abstract syntax tree just after parsing is semantic analysis. And semantic and what is semantic analysis? Well, you know, one way to think about it is it's, the, it's a set of correctness checks that are context sensitive. Uh, context sensitive stands in stark contrast to context free. Uh, recall that when we discussed context free grammars, we were uh, we, we were basically checking whether a program satisfies the context free properties of uh, of the grammar or not. But those checks are only are limited in the nature because they are context free checks. This time we want to do context sensitive checks. And uh, what are some examples of context sensitive checks? We are going to see them very soon. But anything that cannot be done in the parsing step uh, and, is con and because it was context sensitive is basically done in the semantic analysis step. All right. So here are some examples of context sensitive analyses. For example, all identifiers in the program are declared before use. Right, so why, why is this a context sensitive analysis? Well, it's not just about whether something is an identifier or not, which would be a, uh, which would be an analysis of the lexer, but it's also about whether what are all the identifiers that have been defined till this point. So that forms a context of, uh, of the program at any program point. And so, you know, whether the answer is yes or no depends on what is the context at that point. For example, the context could be what are all the identifiers declared until now. Similarly, type checking is a context sensitive analysis as we're going to see soon. So the set of legal programs is a subset of the set of parsable programs. This is generally true. We said that you know, some programs pass the lexing stage, then some programs pass the parsing stage. And then all the programs that parsed, passed the uh, parsing stage are parsable programs. And then, and then the semantic analysis check uh, stage is going to do some further checks on it. And it's going to re determine the set of legal programs. Uh, and, and these legal programs will be, you know, by definition, a subset of all the parsable programs. So here is an example uh, of a semantic analysis, a context sensitive ana uh, uh, semantic analysis. It's actually a very common uh, analysis, which is scope. All right. So for example, what is scope? Well, you know, we need, for example, we scope can be used to match identifier declarations with its users. So let's take this example uh, program or example function from uh, the C programming language, the function foo that takes one argument n of type integer and it has some body uh, it's just an arbitrary body but it declares some variables so for example it declares a variable a and it declares another variable i and then it starts using some of these variables for example in this printf statement it's using the variable a now what is a referring to is determined needs to be determined because you know a is just an identifier and the parsing stage just said that a is an identifier and that's it right and, and it just said that this is a function call and it just said that printf is also an identifier but we never basically checked whether printf is actually a function or not we never really checked whether a is actually a defined declared variable or not so these kind of things are uh, are in the come under the purview of scope which is a semantic analysis Similarly, uh, this is, here is a statement for i is equal to zero, i is less than n, i plus plus. Given that the program has reached the semantic analysis stage, we are already sure that this particular statement is well parsable. What that means is that the for, uh, con the for statement, the for, the for keyword or the for, the for construct is correctly formed. It has an initialization condition, it has a, um, a check condition and a step condition. And these are all the checks that are done during the parsing step because these are context free checks. But here are some context sensitive checks in the same example. For example, what is I? What does it refer to? That would be a part of scope. And in this case, this I refers to this one, right? 
Also notice that in this example, the body of the for function declares an other a, and this a is different from the a in the outside uh, scope. And, and this A refers to the closest A that has been declared and so on. And, and finally, when I come out of the for loop, I again use A and this time the A is actually the outer scope A. So, so let's look at this. So for example, what is N? Well, N is actually referring to this declaration that's coming from the function argument, N. What is, what are these two A's? These are coming from the outer declaration of int A equals zero in the body of foo. What is printf? Well, actually in this program fragment, I haven't really declared printf. So, you know, strictly speaking, this is an illegal program just because of this. But if, but if I wanted to, I should, I could have declared printf somewhere outside of this scope, uh, of scope of foo, and, and then this would refer to that particular printf. All right. What is i? Well, i is uh, referring to this particular declaration i. And what is the a? inside the loop body well these two a's are referring to this particular declaration that is within the loop body okay so these these kind of resolutions of you know, what does an identifier actually refer to is uh, form comes under the purview of scope rules also here is another example j and in fact if you see j is not declared anywhere and so this program has another error none of these errors printf or j would be caught by the context free grammar uh, but they will be caught by the semantic analysis phase. In particular, it will be caught by the scoping rules. All right. So what is the scope? Here's the definition of scope. The scope of an identifier is the portion of the program in which that identifier is accessible. All right. So for example, what, are, what is the portion of the program in which I is accessible? Well, it would be the entire function body after the declaration of I. Similarly, what is the uh, portion of the program in which the second A is accessible? That would be the body of the for loop after the declaration of A and so on. All right, so some, uh, some subtleties about scope, which we may be already familiar with, same identifier may refer to different things in different parts of the program. I'm putting things in quotes and I'm going to explain why. But the point is that the same identifier may refer to different things in different parts of the program. And we already saw that with the example, the same identifier A is referring to different things. Uh, in one case, A is referring to the outer declaration and the other case A is referring to the inner declaration of the for loop, inside the for loop. So, you know, a corollary of this is that different scopes of the same name don't overlap, all right? So, because the, we need a way to distinguish between um, identifiers. If the identifier has the same name, there's actually no way to distinguish. So if this, if two different uh, identifiers have the same name, but uh, they're, they're actually referring to different things, then their scopes must be distinct. It can't happen that in the same scope, the both the uh, things which have the same identifier name are present, right, are accessible. Uh, either one of them is, so for example, in the inner for loop, only the inner A is accessible. The outer A is not accessible. So the inner for loop is not the scope. The, the scope does not include the, the, that part of the program, which, uh, which, has, uh, which is the inner for loop after the declaration of the inner A. All right, why do I say things and why do I put it in quotes? Well, think because identifiers are used to denote or represent multiple things. They can be used to represent objects, memory objects. By objects, I mean, typically I mean regions of memory, all right? So for example, a variable is an object. So when, we, when I say int v, so I'm basically allocating a region of memory for this variable v. And v is the identifier that denotes the object represented by v. Uh, but there can be other things that uh, identifiers represent. For example, identifiers can represent types for example an identifier could represent a struct type in c so i could say struct foo and something and then whenever i say foo struct foo then the foo basically represents that particular type that has been defined and so that would also be qualified as a thing uh, it could be a function declaration uh, in object oriented languages it could be a class name uh, and there there are other things that that you could do with uh, with identifier name for example uh, 
template names or uh, template va uh, type variables uh, in languages like C++ and so on. So identifiers are used to represent different things and uh, the and ev everything should have some uh, some type of scope rules saying that you know what identifier can represent what thing at what point based on the structure of the program uh, as defined by the scoping rules. So uh, in our example we said that you know there are two um, objects in this case one is a and the other is another a and this time i just to distinguish it i just use float a different type for the second one and the first one is still an int a and notice that the scope one so i'm using scope one for the scope of the first a the integer a and that is represented by these red lines the notice that it doesn't include scope two which is the region where uh, the second a float a is accessible right so scopes of, Scopes of different objects can overlap, but if the two objects have the same name, then they cannot overlap because uh, because if they overlap, then uh, there will be an ambiguity. All right. Okay. So there is another uh, other. I mean, the scope is of two types in typically uh, in languages. One is static scope, and other is dynamic scope. Most languages use static scope, and that's why most of us are familiar with static scope uh, scoping. In fact, the example that I used was uh, using static scoping. Uh, more formally, if the scope depends only on the program text and not on runtime behavior, then it's called static scoping. Right? And in fact, all the examples that we saw, uh, you know, where is A accessible? It only depends on how the program is structured and has nothing to do with the runtime behavior of the program. All right. In contrast, uh, you know, a language could be dynamically scoped. In this case, scope depends on execution behavior of the program. Okay, so let's take an example. Let's look at this example, uh, which has two functions, and let's assume that this is a dynamically scoped uh, language. Although I'm using C-like syntax, but 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 C is not statically scoped, while this language I'm assuming to be dynamically scoped. And let's say, you know, it, uh, in a dynamically scoped language, let's say I define a function foo, and then I call bar from the function after declaring a variable a. Now inside, in a dynamically scoped language, what could happen is that inside bar, I could actually access a because a seems, a is in the runtime uh, set of mappings for this uh, particular program, right? So for example, when I call bar three, and I say printf percentage d a, then I can expect, if, it, if this is a dynamically scoped language, uh, then I could expect that this is going to print three because of uh, the declaration a equals three here, all right? So this, is, this would be a dynamically scoped language. Notice that a is not present in the static scope of the language, but a is present if bar is is present in the dynamic scope if it has been called from foo. Now you may ask what happens if bar is called from a, from a function where a is not present. For example, let's say we have a function called foo2 or bars, which basically calls bar without declaring a. In that case, that would be a runtime error. All right, so that's, those are the kind of semantics that some languages would have. Uh, what are some language examples of languages that used dynamically scoping? First of all, it's, it's extremely rare today. But uh, there were early versions of Lisp that used dynamic scoping before Lisp actually transitioned to static scoping. Also, there's a language called Snowball that was using dynamic scoping. All right. So let's take an example to understand how do uh, identifiers get declared uh, and, and then what are their scope rules. So identifier bindings are introduced in different ways in different languages. Uh, in fact, and also we said that identifier bindings could bind to different types of things, right? So they could bind either to objects or types or function declarations or something else, right? So identifier bindings are introduced by different things. So for example, they could be uh, introduced by function definitions. I could define a function called, let's say, printf or foo, and that would be, uh, that would introduce a uh, binding. Every time a binding is introduced, we also need to basically say what have some rules to say what are the scope under which that binding is accessible. All right, so function definitions are a way to introduce bindings for method methods, and these bindings basically give you method names, and so that way you are able to access those methods. 
Similarly, stretched definitions in C uh, provide bindings for type names. Variable definitions provide access, uh, pro provide uh, introduce object names, right? So they provide bindings for names to objects. Or re recall that objects are nothing but regions of memory. Structure field definition. So inside inside of a C struct, I could say int a, int b. These would be the fields of that particular struct, and they are also basically names for, you know, you can say sub objects of objects of that particular type. And so I'm also going to call them bindings for object names, although they are you know, sub objects of a type. Uh, so so that's what they are different type of bindings actually. And then function argument declaration. So I can also create uh, bindings because of function argument declarations. We saw uh, that in our example. For example, if the argument is int n, then I've created a binding from n to the argument value. And depending on whether it's a call by value or a call by reference, it's either a temporary copy of uh, the argument that was passed from the caller, or it, it is actually a reference to the, um, to the object that, that is existing in the caller. All right. Okay, uh, here's in some interesting facts about uh, scoping. Typically, scoping rules obey the most closely nested rule, which means that uh, if I use an identifier A, then I basically look at the most closely nested declaration of A. So we saw this example where if I use the A inside the body of function of the for loop, then that particular use is basically binding to the closest declaration, the closest nested scope in which it was declared. In this case, it is the scope of the for loops body. So that's called the most closely nested rule. Okay, and many most scoping rules basically follow this rule. However, there are exceptions. For example, in C++, member functions can be defined outside class definition and yet access class members. So in C++, you could have a class definition and you could have members of the class and then you could have some methods or functions inside the class, member functions, and that the definition of that function can appear outside of the class. Also, these, the body of these uh, member functions can access the member objects of the class from within the body. Now notice that in the static scoping um, nesting rule that we have just observed, the function that's defined outside of the class does not actually have the member variables declared in any of the nested static, statically nested loop uh, scopes of, uh, of that definition. But, uh, but still we are able to access it and th that's because the, the rules basically permit you to also access uh, the class and, and that's given by the, the qualification of the member function definition using the class name and things like that. You know, those rules are also pretty easy to understand, just that they're not following the most closely nested rule. And you know, this is an ex exception to that, that rule. Actually, there are more exceptions. For example, forward declaration. So typically we would imagine that something should be used only after it has been defined, right? Or uh, with the declaration and, and the definition. But often there are forward declarations in C and C++ where I could define something uh, using an external keyword and then actually uh, actually declare you something uh, with an external keyword and then define it later and use it in the middle. So so th those will be called forward declarations and they would uh, also there are also exceptions to this rule that thing just just look upwards uh, for the and, and look at the close closest nested rule scope most closely nested scope to basically identify the object or the thing, whatever you're looking for. Um, there are also examples in C++ where, you know, you, for example, in, within a class uh, in C++, the member objects can be defined later, but accessed earlier in the function bodies. And that's perfectly okay, in which case the order is really immaterial, whether I define uh, as long as those member objects are present somewhere in the class declaration, we are okay. And that is also kind of, you know, can be thought of as an exception to this most closely nested rule, which would basically look for the closest nesting that has the identifier and it has it before the use, right? So that's not, that's not necessarily followed in C++ class definitions either. In many languages, declaration order is immaterial. So it's not just C++ class, but uh, also many other languages, 
for example i can think of perl or i think even python these languages don't really care about the declaration order uh, especially for functions or method names so i could basically declare a method name uh, later undefine it later and use it earlier and and uh, the runtime would be able to figure out and search for it although it still follows uh, it still looks for its scope uh, and uh, it still follows the most closely nested scope ru uh, uh, rule but it doesn't really follow the order of uh, in which it should appear it can the declaration can actually appear after the use in such languages